So here we are. You ready to go a little early? Oh, sure, sure. If you are, yeah. Thank you. And again, we're probably going to have uh, quite a few people that would uh, watch and or listen to something like this who are novices with respect yeah. to the Kennedy assassination. But it's the Kennedy assassination that's brought us to this session. So let's tell everybody, who are you, Michael? Well, well, who am I? I'm Michael Marcades. I'm the son of Bruce Jeremy, most people in the Kennedy realm recognize that name and uh she was my birth obviously my birth mother her real name is melba christine youngblood marcades uh she does have quite a an interesting life that i've spent half my life researching but she is remembered by most around the world as as a person the woman who knew about the assassination attempt in dallas in advance and tried to warn others. And you've documented your research in the first book. Would you tell us about your first book and how you were up against a, a publication deadline and therefore yeah. didn't have a chance to quite complete, and now you've written a second one? Well, yes. It, you know, at that time, uh, I was honored to have JFK Lancer publishing my first edition and and I was given a hard and fast uh, deadline. And so I wrapped up what I had going at that time. I mean, I, I don't mean to imply that I did it hastily, because I think by that time I'd been writing almost 10 years and revising and researched over 30 years because uh, I wanted to get it right. And, you know, I was very, very grateful to uh, Deborah Conway, JFK Lancer. She was quite a stickler for making sure that anything that I put in writing was provable, that there were documents that could be referenced. You know, other, otherwise, I probably just joined a long line of people who, what's the word, ramble about certain things about the assassination, maybe without any specific point of reference, provable documentation, et cetera. So, you know, from that standpoint, I'm very pleased that, you know, honestly, uh, the the worldwide uh, community related to the JFK assassination can be pretty tough on people. Authors frequently get chewed up and spit out if, if their research isn't really together. You know, so I'm proud that my book has indeed stood the test of time. I've had some pretty some pretty well-known seasoned researchers, you know, look at both of my books, the second edition included, and give me thumbs up. That's not really hard to do. I know some people who have not fared nearly as well, you know, and I'm excited that it, it just astounds me that we live in a world that, you know, I can write a book and it can be sold in Austria, you know, so it, it's just very interesting to see people around the world who are very interested, even, you know, even specifically in Mother's Story, which I guess in some ways isn't surprising, especially since Oliver Stone included her character in his landmark film. Let's talk about that first, and then we'll come back to the books. Uh, first, okay. about the books, uh, after you spoke in Dallas, I didn't have any idea who you were. And I don't have any idea if there was a name affiliated with the person, the woman referenced in Oliver Stone's JFK film in the early 1990s. But then I read the book and I was spellbound. You had me on the edge of my seat. It's well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I have a lot of sweat in that book. And the second edition, like just to kind of reconnect, I knew I wasn't finished, finished. Uh, with the first edition, but the deadline kept me from going forward. It took me another few years to finish up my research on mother's hospitalizations, which are really important in her overall story. But you know, the Oliver Stone film, uh, 
I was never contacted by anybody in connection with the film. Of course, later I did, you know, learn and meet Gary Shaw. We've known each other for, for a very long time. In fact, Gary and Joe West were the individuals who contacted my family and invited us to meet with him. And he was the person who actually opened up Mother's World uh, to us on a very honest level. You know, one that I really had not experienced with my family at all. I, I think in many ways, Mother's life just exhausted uh, her family getting her out of incarcerations, dealing with her being hospitalized for this, that, and the other. And of course, her criminal record, which is lengthy. Extended, uh, yeah. Yes. It, <laughs> it, isn't, it isn't something that my uh, Baptist, Southern Baptist Christian-based family really was interested in looking at. But I got to the point where I had to know everything I could discover, not because of her connection to Kennedy, although that is a very interesting, unbelievable facet. You know, in the the character in Oliver Stone's film, most people thought that was just a composite of individuals who knew, knew this, that, and the other. And, you know, it wasn't, it, it takes somebody who's really into research to discover that Sally, uh, what's her last name? Uh, the actress. Anyway, uh, her last name is is escaping me at the moment, but she was responsible actually for going to Oliver Stone and begging that he not omit her character uh, in his film and that she portray him. So I have had uh, the opportunity to visit with her. Very interesting lady. Uh, based on what I know about my mother, I think she did an excellent job in depicting her. But, you know, a lot of people just, if you don't dig, you don't learn. And, and, and honestly, we live in a, in my humble opinion, we live in a world where a lot of people don't read much. They look for easy answers on the internet. And, you know, that's, that's not exactly how I've gotten to this point about Mother's story. That just wouldn't wouldn't have cut it. Yeah, to say the least. Um, why don't we go back and uh, tell people you're referencing your mother's portrayal in Oliver Stone's JFK. What happens in the early part of that film? It's right at the beginning, more or less, after the historical vignettes that Stone uh, trots out. All of a sudden, there's this woman that gets dumped uh, beside a highway and then there's a, a delusional woman in a hospital yes part of the things that she she says are understandable and others aren't but i i would imagine the general audience is very unaware of you know what what's going on what is this who is this lady so go By ahead. The way, I, I just I just remembered, excuse me, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh Sally Kirkland is the actress who portrayed mother. Sorry. That's I okay. hate getting I hate getting older, you know. That <laughs> uh, happened to me too. So you know that you know, mothers, just as an aside, mother's story is complicated. Dozens and dozens of situations that, you know, honestly, if you don't read them constantly, it's easy to overlook something. So my apologies to Sally Kirkland. But in, in the in the film, JFK, by the way, it's pretty surreal for me to watch the film and realize that he's depicting my birth mother. I mean, it's just very strange. But as you said, at the beginning of his film, he intersplices little snippets uh, of her. You, you referenced her being the scene that depicts her throw, being thrown out of a car. I'm sure that happened to her at some point because she spent most of her time running around with seedy people. She had a big mouth. And so I, I don't doubt that somebody threw her out of a car at some point. But the scene of her ranting, trying to communicate what she knows in advance about Kennedy being in danger in Dallas that that is has well documented in the HSCA documents. Lieutenant Francis Fergay makes reference to that, produces documentation, et cetera. And, and I have uncovered medical records 
that also corroborate such. So at that point, I think Stone's just trying to share with, with the audience that there was a woman. He doesn't mention her name, if I'm remembering correctly, but she does seem to be stressed in that hospital situation. And of course, if you dig very deeply at all, you discover that mother was mother had substance abuse issues. She was a heroin addict. From an early age, she had tremendous issues with alcohol consumption. She became a different person under the influence of that. But in that hospital scene, Stone is making reference to the Musa Hospital in Eunice, Louisiana, where mother was taken after an encounter at a place that people refer to as the Silver Slipper uh, in Eunice, outside, right outside of the city proper. But she was going through heroin withdrawal at that point. She'd been beat up, tossed around, hit by, hit by, you know, nudged, hit, nudged, run into by a man on the highway called, his name was Frank Odom. And so she was taken to Musa Hospital and that's where she was babbling about all of this. And, you know, mother's reputation didn't encourage people to take her seriously at that point. I mean, most people today, if you knew the individual was a heroin addict, you know, a drug runner, a prostitute, uh, et cetera, you might not necessarily believe everything that comes out of her mouth, but obviously history proved that she was speaking the truth. And any idea who they were that she was talking about First, and maybe if it is she who was dumped out of the car, who are they that dumped her out of the car? Yes, I have researched that Silver Slipper scene extensively. We do know that if there were two men, Emilio Santana and gee, let me let me just make sure I'm not stumbling over a word here. Uh, Sergio Acacia, Kelly, what am I forgetting? What's his name? Oh, Sergio Acacia Smith and Emilio Santana. They were the two assassins with whom she was writing, purported assassins. At least they had spoken around her in this drug run that they were processing for Jack Ruby from Miami to Dallas, that they were indeed en route to Dallas to kill the president. And, you know, who knows what condition Mother was in in that car, but as I referred to earlier, she could be a formidable female, especially un under the influence. She, she, We know for a fact that she got into a serious argument with those two men. They did stop at the Silver Slipper, which was in and of itself a fairly regular location for prostitution coordination, for drug drops, et cetera. And so we know, actually the owner, the manager of the Silver Slipper later identified these two men by name to Ann Dishler and uh, Francis Frager when he came back to do subsequent research following all of this. So, so we know those names thanks to Mac Manuel, the manager of Silver Slipper and Francis Frager. But what happened in that bar if you will, is mother got riled. You know, I have a feeling she was going through heroin withdrawal at the moment. It was starting to kick up in her system. And, and she probably, even my father has admitted to me before he died that some days he just couldn't handle mother. And so she got upset with those people. Evidently, they got extremely pissed and angry with her and tossed her out into the parking lot and left her on her own. That is where she stumbled up, pulled herself together, started walking down the highway right outside of, of Eunice where Musa Hospital was. And that is where Frank Odom hit her, nudged her, whatever, picked her up and took her to the hospital. And, you know, things get a little bit more complicated from that point. A couple of things. First of all, either of those two men that you've just referenced end up in the official record. And by that, I mean Warren Report, House Select Committee on Assassinations, the ARRB, any of those. House Select Committee does delineate these men by name. 
It, it's a part of Frigier's actual documented testimony. And is it fair for us to assume that you have been visited that pub and it's still exists? I, I, I have not gone to that place, but I have gone to a number of places, specifically hospitals. And, I, you know, I've deep dived, researched Angola, et cetera. You know, it just wasn't possible for me to go every place. I don't really feel I, I have been to her site where I believe she was murdered and set up on the side of the road. I've been to that exact location, uh, but I have not been to the Silver Slipper. All right. Let's actually, actually I doubt that it's there. Yeah, that would make sense, but I'm mm -hmm. just curious. It was important for me to go to as many places as possible where Mother was located, you know, going to the hospital in Gladewater where she breathed her last breath was was very intense experience for me maybe we can detail that a little bit later but i, I want to stay here for a minute because, because these two fellows who are involved in a sinister activity uh, mm -hmm. involving your mom you referenced jack ruby that they mm -hmm. were gun runners for jack ruby so we need a time stamp here when does your mother become involved with these two fellows and how do they become involved? If you know, I don't want to put you. Well, you know, mother, mother's involvement on in this level of criminal world, if you will, was a progressive thing for her. the The scene that we're just talking about right now is like a month or a month and a half prior to Kennedy being assassinated in Dallas. Why she got linked up with these individuals? My guess is. Mother had her own role to play. She probably didn't select these individuals. They were probably assigned to guard, watch, supervise, whatever, what she was doing. And, and that's how she became connected with them. I, I have a feeling that she knew them fairly well. I don't believe this was probably the first time that she was in any of this drug running, gun running activities, prostitution, all of those activities. I think she knew them fairly well. And all of this, you know, her her work for Jack Ruby and mob extensions from him are all documented in, in, in the House Senate Committee on Assassinations. Okay. We should clarify a little bit here. Uh, your mother wasn't uh, aware, other than the conversation she overheard, but she was not part of the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. She Absolutely. Did not. Absolutely not. Yeah, she, 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 just, not, she just had the really good luck of being with people who were. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure that. Yeah, know, no, no, children. you know, that, you know, uh, it's interesting to me with all mother's troubles, when it got down to the bottom line of this threat to the president, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly proud that she did everything she could to herald the danger to Kennedy. You know, I, I think it speaks to the nature of her upbringing, although mothers, she's she's just such a complex individual. I think, uh, was she an addict? Yes. Was she a decent human being? Yes. I mean, you know, drugs and alcohol turn individuals into persons they're not normally. You know, mother was, she was playful. She was drop-dead gorgeous. She wasn't unintelligent. She picked up things really quickly. Jack Ruby trusted her to gather all of the money payments and distribute job, you know, drugs on these jobs. So uniquely, she was a trusted individual in that world. And she wasn't, you know, some people think, well, all drug addicts are idiots. Not true. When I read your book, uh, uh, I kept expecting this would be an American story, that it would play out, that she would cure herself of the difficulties. I mean, her life is like a yo-yo. It went up and down, up and down. There were prosperous times. There were desperate times. But yes. also, as you said, drugs and alcohol uh, were involved in her life and altered her personality. Yeah, and which, which uh, you know, which mother somebody met, uh, and at what yeah. time, which yeah. mother you, know. you may remember that my mother contracted encephalitis when she was 12. 
I do. Really and uh, honestly, uh, until I got serious about researching that, I had no idea what that meant. But I guarantee you, uh, in 1935, contracting encephalitis uh, as a child was a very serious thing. You know, we take for granted right now that we think we can go to the ER and everything will be processed, hospitalized, or whatever. But in 1935, that certainly wasn't the case. You know, mother was, she had a uh, high fever for 30 days. She was hospitalized. And when she was released, the physicians warned my grandparents that they should keep their eyes on her because, and keep her above all, keep her away from any kind of substance abuse, alcohol. Of course, they weren't successful with that, but but they knew that mother's condition, her disposition, her mental makeup, all of that was altered by this uh, tragic encounter with encephalitis. She was 12 years old at the time. She was 12 years old. And it's not going to be too long after that where she takes off for the first time. Maybe Yes, years. yes. She was, she was around 13 or 14 the first time she left home. I mean, which doesn't really make any sense. To me, you know, my grandparents raised their children in a very different time. I do know that uh, that my aunts were, when they got out of line, they were punished. I mean, end of discussion. It's a very different world that we live in today. But, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what happened to them when they messed up. But I do remember after my grandparents took charge of me at mother's insistence, I, as a young child, well, experienced my grandfather's discipline. Even to this day, I, I think I was, we were in a grocery store and I think my grandparents had told me unequivocally, don't touch anything, don't pick up anything, you know, in a store, we don't ever do that. Well, as a young child, I made the mistake of, of grabbing a grape off of the produce rack and eating it. And uh, when I got home, I still remember the, the, the belt spanking that I got from my grandfather. I mean, it was that uh, intense, you know what I'm saying? And at that point, oddly, that was the only spanking that I received from my grandparents. And I, I surmise that my grandmother sat her husband down and said, look, we're not going to do things like we've done them in the past. And so I say all of that just to contribute to my mother's mindset. You know, maybe she was getting away from that strong-handed discipline. Maybe she felt the need to be free uh, on her own. Fortunately, she was retrieved at that young age. And, uh, but then later at 16, she ran away successfully to the Houston area and, and the rest of her life is, is history. And our audience, uh, this is a terribly difficult task I'm asking of you because you've written books about that and people can see a lot of detail in there. But she ends up in prostitution and she ends up at times making pretty good money. And then she comes back home from time to time and finds out that she can't stay again and takes off on the road. And at some point she ends up with sinister people underworld people. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yes. The fact that she goes through periods of normalcy. My research has proven that she was married four times. You know, honestly, I don't know why her marriage did not work with my father. You know, my father, Edward Joseph Mercatus, was just a hardworking individual who was completely taken with her. He met her at the Blue Angel on Bourbon Street in Louisiana she was one of the headliner dancer strippers there. And and I assume that's how I came into being. By I was going to ask you about that. So your dad's a New Orleans guy. And I was yes. about the relationship that led uh, to you. And you've just you've just told us. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but their marriage did not last long. Mother had already been married once before. I mean, all it, please understand all of this was new data for me. I grew up not knowing my father. I didn't meet him until I was 38 years old. He, of course, knew nothing about mother's life, demise. Although 
I do remember him being emotionally taken by learning that she was dead. I, I think he, I think he loved her and would have done anything to keep her. It was mother's issue. You know, her coming and going. It's like she could not stay in normal patterns of life. You know, maybe she would get away from alcohol for a while. Maybe she'd get away from drugs for a while. And and the demon would return and it would take over her life. And then she was off into another set of escapades. But the, pro, you know, in what does a 16-year-old girl do uh, around 1940 to survive life? I, you know, when she went to Houston, I'm sure all she uh, could knew to do was uh, be a waitress, sell herself on the streets, assist in the distribution of drugs on the streets. We know for sure that she did that by, by her connection with William Billitzer of the, of the Houston Police Department. At that time, the Houston Police Department was extremely corrupt. Uh, Mother actually became an informant for him, but her, her dancing in and out of normalcy is such a sad part of her life. You know, at that time, when she was pregnant with me, she indeed was in Houston at the time. And my grandparents, who were extremely religious individuals, my my grandmother, I remember her telling me this story, one of the few stories that they told about mother that they, my grandmother said, Tom, we're going to Houston. You know, uh, I feel like God is leading us to go get Michael. And indeed, at that time, I was in a difficult situation with my mother. I was about four and a half years old at that time. They, uh, oddly, they got in the car and drove to Houston, headed for the seedy side of town, so to speak, and miraculously saw my mother on, the, on a corner plying her trade. Mother flags them down, runs over to the car and says, I've got to take you to Michael. And where she took them was an extremely rundown, dilapidated, difficult place for humanity to survive, to quote, unquote, live. She was in a, a, an apartment that had the word whore spray painted on her door. They got inside. I was there at about four and a half years old in this roach infested apartment all by myself. And so... That was the day that things really changed. Mother wound up asking, said, look, I can't do this. I, I can't raise him. My life is, uh, I don't know what words she used, but I'm surely said, you know, my life is just too messed up, too dangerous. Can you take him? And, you know, from that point forward, I went home with my grandparents. They legally adopted me. And from that point forward, I very very seldom saw my mother, but I was with her for those first four, four and a half years of my life. I know she deposited me at my dad's off and on in New Orleans. I remember my grand, my grandmother there in New Orleans. I didn't know in, in much, of, you know, obviously I'm two, three, four years old, but, but research has proven a lot about my being taken there. She'd come back, come back and pick me up take me to other places. And then she winds up obviously making pretty poor decisions about leaving her child alone in an apartment. Where um, was home for your grandparents and therefore for you? You referenced New Orleans for your dad, Houston for your mom when she decided to pass you on to the grandparents and you went mm -hmm. home with them. Where is home? Home for my grandparents. Well, they were They were East Texans. They, my grandmother grew up in Tig, Texas, in East Texas. I think they he, she met my grandfather in church. They got married. They moved to an area called Aldine, I believe, which is just north of Houston, where they did tenant farming. And they were always extremely poor. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I'm pretty sure that my mother and my aunts grew up with bare minimum clothing, all of that stuff. But my grandparents did everything they could to take care of them. But but then my grandfather shifted to 
construction work because of all that was going on about Houston becoming the mega city that it now is. Construction was everywhere. Being a farmer wasn't that productive. They never seemed to have much money. And, and, and eventually he wound up, they wound up moving from Houston to Dallas, where I basically grew up uh, in Duncanville, right outside of Dallas, where my grandfather, even till the years when I was in college, was still doing construction work. Okay. And your mother had some means from time to time. If she's traveling around, she's in New, New Orleans and she's going to Houston and back home. She had to have some means from time to time. How? What provided that? Well, I'm, I'm sure that her prostitution and her payments for distributing uh, drugs for Ruby and others, I don't know for sure that the Houston Police Department paid her for information. I wouldn't be surprised, but it obviously wasn't very much given where she had left me. But, you know, mother, pro mother had a hard time holding on to cash. You know, from studying her tax returns, she never made a huge amount of money. She sometimes was paid several thousand dollars for her work in distributing drugs. But my guess is that money got sucked up uh, with her abuses. Right. Um, Jack Ruby again has surfaced. Did your mom know Jack Ruby personally or was yes, she? Yes, she Go worked. Ahead. It's documented that she worked for him in the pink, pink slipper. Uh, and then also at the Carousel Club, oh. yes, sir. Uh, she knew she knew Jack Ruby. She knew Lee Harvey Oswald from his coming to the Carousel Club. She actually knew them fairly well because at some point she reported to Francis Frigier that it was ridiculous that the newspapers were implying that Ruby and Oswald did not know each other because she actually knew them to be bed partners. So all of that is, is information she gleaned from working around at Ruby's clubs. You know, mother, she, she wasn't very important in terms of her being warned about, worried about what she knew. I'm sure she saw, witnessed, and heard lots of things in uh, Ruby's clubs, but I don't think anybody worried about her being of any danger. I thought that by that time in her life, she was completely under the control of those individuals. You know, I've known uh, Beverly Oliver for many, many years, and I've never heard her say anything. Uh, I wonder if she knew your mom. I would suggest that it's a strong possibility. Maybe you've talked to Beverly. You know, I, I have. I, I, I count Beverly a friend. Um, she has never said directly that she knew Mother. But, you know, Beverly's, she, I, I'm sure she knows things that she has never revealed to anyone. But we do know that Mother was well acquainted with some of the other more famous entertainers, if you will, for Jack Ruby. And I believe the last time I saw her alive, she had actually taken a cab from uh, either the, the Pink Slipper or the Carousel Club and come out to our house in Duncanville, outside of Duncanville, very unexpectedly. And that's a that's a 25-mile cab ride. You know, so she had to have access to cash off and on. Sometimes she had everything maybe and sometimes she had nothing it, it was just the way her life was can we time stamp that also uh, when she came out to the house with that long cab ride that was that is that has got to be sometime around the late 50s early 60s you know because i was in, i was in the fifth grade at that time so that makes sense. Sometime around the late fifties, I was in you see first grade, early sixties. I have to think back. I believe I was in first grade in 1959. So that's that's about that time period. But obviously, it was right before, pretty near the time of the Kennedy assassination in the big picture. So that's the last time you saw your mom. The last time I saw her was, uh, you know, and I, I remember it's so I'm 71 years old and I, I remember well that day that the yellow cab pulled up in front of our tiny house outside of Duncanville, Texas. And remind me, don't let me forget to tell you a little bit about that neighborhood. 
but I remember seeing her just bounce, bounce out of the cab, absolutely drop dead beautiful. You know, when she was normal, when she wasn't under the influence of substance abuse, she was just beautiful, normal. I remember her being in our house for two or three days. She did everything from iron handkerchiefs, you know, to wash dishes. I don't remember being really close to her in the house then, but, you know, that I woke up one morning and she was gone. I mean, that that's just the way it was. My grandparents never knew when she was coming, never knew when she was going. And I honestly believe that that was due to her determination to protect our family. And that, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, G. Can I offer something? Yeah, quick? Reggie has something here. Yes, Reggie. I, uh, in some ways, I think her credibility is that it comes from the fact that she was easily discredited, right? Like she was in. Yes. And so she would be privy to all this information, but mm -hmm. people could say, oh, she's a prostitute, whatever. She would easily discredit it, right? Is that, do you think that's, I, I think that ironically, that is part of her credibility in this whole yes. situation. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, t I assume that's why no one really listened to her until it was too late. Right. Right. You know, they, they just figure she's babbling out of her mind, going through withdrawal. I mean, Honestly, I don't know that I would have believed my mother if she told me so. You know, I, I don't think her own parents believed her very often. Mother had a way with depicting her situation in a light that she wanted it to be. But all of a sudden, she predicts the assassination of the president, and it happens. Yes. And of course, you know, at that point, Francis Frege, you know, is just stunned, you know, that the woman that he has talked to, who he put in a jail in Eunice and she was going through such terrible heroin withdrawal that she stripped herself of her clothes, <clears throat> tried to set herself on fire, was banging her body against the wall in the cell. All of a sudden that individual has predicted, you know, this most incredible murder on the streets of Dallas, you know, so mother, She's quite a conundrum, to say the least. Did she identify the location when she revealed that? Did she say it was going to happen in Dallas? She said it was going to happen in Dallas. You know, and remember that Sergio Alcarcha Smith and Amelia Santana, the two men she was with at the Silver Slipper incident, they were, uh, quote, unquote, en route to Dallas to kill the president. You know, I, I've learned from experts like Gary Shaw that there were probably dozens of assassins in Dealey Plaza that day. Perhaps there were various teams of assassins. Nobody knew what they were doing until the last minute. That whole situation just blows my mind. That information, not quite that number of people. You've added a lot of people, but consensus among many serious researchers is that there were multiple teams anyway. We won't put yes. them on. Right. With no idea what their chore was, but at the last minute they would get information and a target would be identified and in some form of triangulation. As Craig Roberts said years ago, the target would be taken out and that's what happened. We did a podcast a few months ago with Robert Groden where we okay. talked about nothing but the Zapruder film for an hour and a half. Wow. And during that time, he his conclusion is that there were 11 shots fired. You know, obviously, one person couldn't have done that, certainly not from the sixth floor window in the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository building, where right. the board commission says Lee Harvey Oswald is, and in 5.6 seconds gets off three shots that do all the damage in uh, with a six and a half millimeter Anlicker Carcano piece of junk Italian World War II rifle, and nobody's right. ever been able to duplicate that. So, yes, you know, and I honestly, I I believe Robert Groden. I mean, I, I believe his what hit the value and validity of his research. I mean, I don't know anyone of Groden or Shaw's research level that would not agree that there were lots of shots being fired in Dealey Plaza that day. Honestly, I, I don't even, I'm not even sure Oswald fired. 
I just don't, I don't know for sure, but I just don't believe Oswald was the individual who, who, who murdered the president that day. You know, I know you're well aware that I have recently edited and published a book by Gary Shaw, Brian Edwards, and Ricky White about Roscoe White's amazing story, all the documentation that was discovered underground in a waterproof container, et cetera, that details his being one, one of the shooters he claims, you know, of course, to be the shooter behind the, 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 the picket fence. Behind the grass, you know, yeah. Yeah, behind the grass, you know, yes. And, you know, the diary, just the diary alone that was discovered uh, is incredible you know, validating in my mind. I mean, he confesses to being uh, an assassin for the CIA, having having murdered over 20 people worldwide for the CIA. But the bottom line about this is, it this wasn't just about one lone nut assassin. Part of me feels sorry for Lee Harvey Oswald's family. You talk about being framed for the murder uh, uh, of all history. I mean, I can't prove one way or the other, but I think most serious research don't believe Lee Harvey Oswald did this. You're absolutely right. In what you sent to me before we joined each other today in this podcast, you mentioned connections with your mother and the MK Ultra program. Yeah. I'd, I'd like for you to talk about that a little. Reggie and I have done some work on that already. So, well, you know, I, I knew nothing about MK Ultra, but uh, mother wound up being hospitalized. Num number one, based on medical records that I've discovered, I believe mo mother was subjected to this kind of treatment on more than one hospitalization, particularly the hospital in Norman, Oklahoma, which was a known center for MK Ultra experimentation control of individuals. In fact, Lee Harvey Oswald actually applied for a job at that very same hospital. You know, it's just, it's just so sad what my mother went through. You know, people, the treatment of people who supposedly had substance abuse or some kind of mental condition at that time was pretty archaic. Shock therapy was applied on individuals, you know, often to their demise. You know, I think they were just looking for ways to control people to get them to calm down. But a mother was subjected to that kind of treatment in more than one hospital. But as I just said, the, the Norman, Oklahoma hospital is a very interesting facility. It's a little deeper than I have gone, but I do know that MK Ultra practices did occur in that hospital. And I, I do believe from the medical records that mother was subjected to that. Do you suspect uh, that some kind of clandestine service was interested in possibly using her? Well, or just I, just testing. I think she was used constantly, and I think people used whatever means was necessary to get her to do what they needed done. Of course, they always had the the dangling threat of harming her family. You know, honestly, she was with bad people that wouldn't have thought twice about harming me as a child. I mean, I'm, I referred earlier to the neighborhood that we lived in outside of Duncanville. We'll get back to the MK Ultra, but only in the past two years have I learned that the really small neighborhood that we lived in, in the, in the outskirts of Duncanville, buried deep in the woods, was a protected family community that the neighbor, uh, the the family down the street from where we lived, my grandfather had uh, unusual connections with him. That man had actually found that house for us out in the middle of nowhere where we could be, where I, in fact, he told his daughters that, look, there's a young boy coming to our neighborhood. He's his name is Mike. I need you to keep your eyes on him, protect him, you know, do whatever you have to do. Sadly, I have not been able to get the brother in that household to meet with me, but evidently he knows lots of things about the interconnectedness of my grandfather and his father. I, I don't know, with bootlegging or drugs or something, which it's just actually unbelievable, but unfortunately, I believe I believe it's true. But the but the MK Ultra thing was a devious program. 
to initially, I believe, if I understand it correctly, to control or extract information from spies, but later on was used in the CD underworld to control individuals. There was a, a murder that occurred in New Mexico, the murder of a man who moved from the East Coast, just a run-of-the-mill middle-tier bank teller, uh, but he wound up buying 2,000 acres in New, New Mexico. And he wound up being murdered. And first parts of that family actually believe that mother was part of the, the scheme or the plan to lure this individual to a certain place. He was murdered for sexual favors, and he was murdered there. Why, I don't know. But, but I think that 2,000-acre ranch was used for a variety of trainings for gunmen, what it, mercenaries, whatever you want to, however you want to refer to. Those who were controlling MK Ultra desired as an outcome from people like possibly your mom. Yes, and it, uh, I'm so glad I didn't forget to tell you this. In that particular situation, she was arrested and taken to the police station. But in a very short period of time, mother walked out the front door of the police station. And this is documented in newspaper articles. The, a policeman actually flagged down a cab for her and she was, disappeared into nothing. That's unusual, isn't it? <laughs> it is. My, you know, mother had, had a tendency, I believe it's the JFK film where one of the characters says, you know, well, these people just walk through the, between the raindrops. And, and honestly, Mother actually did that several times. Fascinating. Do you have another? Just, uh, well, I just come back to that, where it's like, it seems like there was an undercurrent in, of her history that we we're never going to know. Like she was connected somehow, right, to the clandestine world that we talk about. Well, yeah, she obviously was connected. You know, it, it, I can't believe she kept it all from our family, but she did. Right. Um, you know, everything about her death, you know, I was 12 years old when she died. And at that point in time, my family blamed all of that, blamed her death on Jerry Don Moore. Some people may be familiar with his name. But out in out in the middle of nowhere in East Texas, outside of Gladewater, Jerry Don Moore was taking home his girlfriend in the middle of the night, sometime around one or two a.m. in the morning. And as he as he went down the highway in that area, he noticed a maroon or a red colored Chevrolet off in off the side of the road behind some trees. And uh, but nothing in the road. And when he came back, you know, he ran across three suitcases that had been placed in the middle of the road so that the driver would have to dodge the suitcases. And once they did, they wouldn't have had time to react against mother being placed on the side of the road for the longest period of time. My family thought that. Jerry Don Moore ran over my mother's head in his dilapidated vehicle. There is no, no, no knowledge of the suitcases. Go no, on. well, yeah, well, where, you know, somebody obviously had access to the suitcases and placed them out there. But, you know, it would be years before I would discover medical records. You know, I don't think anybody intended mother to live when they placed her on the side of the road miraculously, when Jerry Don Moore came across, she was still breathing faintly. I do believe he ran over her forearm, broke her forearm, uh, and he, you know, God bless him, stopped in the, you know, at two or two o'clock in the morning, went back to her body, scared to death that he had run over her, picked her up, and uh, left the suitcases at that time, Took her to a doctor out in out in the middle of nowhere. He basically said, "I can't do anything for her." She ends up being taken to Gladewater Hospital, and she received almost nine hours of fully documented medical care in the Gladewater Hospital. 
the odd thing about that is her death certificate is stamped in multiple co locations, DOA, which most of us understand means dead on arrival. And then there is also this con conflicting information on her death certificate that she received care for 8.5 hours. You know, so what is it? Is she dead when she gets there? You know, they put a cast on her arm. And of course, she did die, die in the hospital, which we know was had some affiliation with the mob. You know, my, the East Texas was, as I understand it, pretty infiltrated with the mob at that time. Do you know but, any specifics about the mob in that area, for example? I, I do not. I do not. I do know this. It's a it's a miracle that the hospital authorities even discovered who mother was. She never carried identification with her. Uh, Jerry Dunn Moore, once he had turned her over to uh, hospital authorities, went back out to the scene where he where he thought he had run over, gathered her uh, her her three suitcases, brought brought them back to uh, the hospital. And, and surprisingly, mother had a letter in one of those suitcases from my grandmother. And otherwise, no okay. one would, I don't think she would, no, people would have discovered who she was for years, maybe never, but she had her name. Her name was obviously on the letter as the addressee. They contacted my grandparents and, and the rest is history at that point in time. Boy, this is relatively 30 years before DNA. So yes. you're, you're probably absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, no, which is a real shame. You know, I, my my research has I, I, some people who are smarter than me believe that the research that I've discovered related to the medical records proves that she had been shot in the head at that point. Uh, all of that was, my family never mentioned that. I don't know if the hospital never told them or what, but they didn't pursue any of that. And so it's just clear as day in the first paragraph of the typed 21 pages of medical records that she had a punctate stellate wound to the forehead. And I've asked almost a dozen doctors to explain to me what that is. And they said, well, it's most probably a gunshot wound, could be the result of like a tire tool, you know, her being hit by something like that. But the punctate stellate wound wouldn't have wouldn't have contributed to a you know, wouldn't have been done by a lug wrench. Most people believe that the mark on her it was a close range gunshot wound to the forehead. So I'm going to play uh, a naive person and try to summarize what you're saying here. It appears that your mom was shot, executed, but run over as a means to cover up that. Exactly. Into a hospital and for approximately a little bit less than nine hours, she was under treatment for a person who arrived at the hospital in the official record dead on arrival. Yes. That's exactly right. You know, there's there, there's one other really odd thing. You know, I think it's a miracle that mother had the letter in her suitcase. Just wasn't like her to carry anything that would have identified her in any way. But my uncle, one of my uncles was charged with the task of driving from Dallas to Gladewater Hospital to identify her body. And he reported to our family that he said, well, I'm here to identify Melba Christine Youngblood Marcades. And, and the hospital authorities told him, well, s someone has already come by the, the hospital and identified her and reported to the authorities that he was a red-haired cousin. Cousin? So, a cousin. Huh. So, you know, somebody arrived at the hotel, excuse me, at the hospital to make sure that mother was dead long before family before our family member arrived to identify her. I just think that is just fascinating. Incredible and mm -hmm. fascinating yes. mm -hmm. and disgusting. Yes, it is. You right. know, 
You know, it, it, there's a lot of sadness about Mother's life. I feel so robbed by not getting to know her, you know, and like I told you, I didn't meet my father till I was almost 40 years old. And so, but, but, but her life, what a tragic train wreck, one after the other. She just didn't seem to be able to get off of the rails. And for our listening audience, whether you consider this to be pretty detailed or lacking in detail, they can find it in your two books. Would you say one would need to read the first book before the second one, or does the second one encompass everything that people would need to know? To know the there's, no, there, there's, no need, there's no need to read anything but the revised second edition. You know, honestly, by the time the first edition was published, I was exhausted and had the deadline looming. And so I submitted it and I'm proud of it, but I just know that it wasn't finished. And I did extensive revision of all the material uh, in the first edition, but I also added detail about all seven of her hospitalizations, which are pretty important. And, you know, at some point, I, I don't know how you want to do this, but at some point, Mother was sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. for two years for a crime that she committed in Louisiana. Now, how does a know-nothing prostitute heroin addict get sent to St. Elizabeth's? Your audience may not know. I didn't know about it, but it is the elite hospital for family members of armed services owned by the CIA. Mother was sent there for two and a half years. I believe she was subjected to MK Ultra techniques and extensive shock therapies there. I have medical records from that place as well. And the only person who was ever allowed to visit my mother there was my Lieutenant Colonel, career army Lieutenant Colonel who was based at the Pentagon. Uh, he and his wife and daughter were actually were allowed to visit mother once during that two years. Other family members, it just wasn't possible. I mean, why was she sent to St. Elizabeth's? It doesn't make any sense. You know, she's a nobody that was frequently referred to as, you know, someone completely disposable like you take out the trash. We should probably let people know at least a little bit about you. You're not retired. You're still working. Where do you yes. work? You have a full-time job. And I know that job very well because I did 48 years myself wow. in, that, in that profession. But yeah, what do you do today? I mean, it's not like that's all. this is all you're doing is researching your mother's life and death. No. No, uh, I am a, a, a professional conductor, music educator. Uh, most of my career, I've taught it at, 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 at the university college level. I have done some 5A, 6A um, choral teaching here in Texas. And at the moment, I am uh, working with some, some middle, 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade choir students. And I'm really... Somebody looks at me and says, why in the world with all of your education and experience are you doing that? And some days, honestly, I really don't know why I'm doing it. <laughs> but, but when I was that age, I had two or three individuals who, who had Im strong, strong impacts on my life. And I believe I became a professional musician, but due to their influence. And so I just made up my mind. The opportunity presented itself that I would spend as much time as I possibly could trying to positively impact young young musicians through the choir room at, at a middle school in my area. Sounds to me like they're lucky to have you. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Some days I wonder. But when you, know, you and I were communicating about doing this, you were articulating some of the frustrations of the end of school year and being yes. up at deadlines again and not able to do this until your head had cleared and school was over, which it now is. And yes. we are. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm delighted to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity. But it, at the end of every school year, it takes about two weeks of shutting down my brain for things to stop running through my head that are related to work, whether it be administrative details or music. I mean, I, it, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night during the school year and immediately songs that I'm teaching come 
you know, are just right there at the for, <laughs> forefront of my thoughts. But uh, it's nice to be, have a little bit of time off. You're speaking to a member of the choir right now. All right, all right, all right. So, 48 uh, years, I don't see how you survive. Well, I loved it, to be honest with you. I, I It was great for me. I, I didn't really consider it as a job to the extent of, as a matter of fact, I said to myself early on, this is not a job to do if you don't like it. You have a responsibility to the people you're working with to make this promise. And I made it to myself. If I ever wake up someday and say, oh, God, I've got to go to work today, then that's it. I'm going to get out. And that never happened to me. I just got yeah. too old. <laughs> and, yeah. And well, well you know, I, I do have a deep seated passion for, for musical art. And, you know, I, I keep trying to infuse that love uh, into my students, whether they be college or, or sixth grader. It's really different now. Public education, as you know, is in a mess. So, you know, I frequently run into students who don't care about what they're doing. Doesn't matter what grade they make. They don't necessarily apply themselves. But I keep trying, like you, you know, I keep, I'll keep doing it until I wake up and say, uh, this isn't fun anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I'm going to bring Reg in for one last thing, if it's okay, because he's a musician, uh, oh. as a, a recorded musician, I might say. So I'm sure this is resonating with him. Well, okay. I, just, I just want to add one last point, which is in, in terms of the story um, with your mother, um, it's like when, when astronomers, they talk about the universe and it, it, uh, you know, it's sort of expanding in ways that don't make sense, right? And so they inject these dark matter and dark energy properties, right? That's a, mm -hmm. It doesn't work without those things. Mm -hmm. That's what your mother's story sounds like to me, where it's like there are things happening that are just beyond our, beyond what we're able to see, right? We're, we're sort of, it's sort of conjecture happening, but um that that's sort of what is continuing to happen to me as we're discussing i'm like oh my god there's so much that we're just never going to know yeah if i'm if i'm understanding and hearing you correctly it is you know honestly i have been overwhelmed by my mother's story yeah it is it's well, just so will, when they know you're the full story others will be as well michael it is you know i've had i've had people come in my office who have read the book, who were in tears and committed to recontacting their drug troubled parents, you know, and, you know, people say, well, how could you forgive her? Well, my gosh, why would I want to stomp around this earth, you know, just steaming at her? I mean, it's, it doesn't accomplish anything. She uh, may have been a CIA agent. Like that's, I'm sorry. She may have been a CIA agent, you know, like that's, well, right. we know we know for sure that near the end of her life, she was receiving monthly checks from the government. Right. We know that she was, uh, I, we have her FBI informant number. I mean, this stuff isn't made up. It's just hard to believe. And, you know, honestly, I don't think, I honestly believe that I'm the only one in my extended family who, and my, and my wife, who has been a great source of encouragement and through getting the second edition done, I couldn't have, I, at that point, I was just so tired. I couldn't have done it without her help. But I, you know, I had to know the truth, you know, and I, you know, I just, as I say at the end of my second edition, we, I don't have time for pointing the finger at her. Why not be forgiving? I mean, you only get one mother in this world. I'd give anything to see her and to have had her in my life. It didn't work out that way, but hopefully I'll see her later i would say the photographs that you've provided in your book or mm -hmm. books i would suppose now uh, don't necessarily do her justice you do you happen to have has anybody ever provided you with a photograph that could showcase the outstanding beauty of your mother well i do and i do have a lot of photos and of course i put, could not put all of them in the book but i do have photos that that show how very beautiful she was and not to repeat myself, but she wasn't an idiot. She was smart. 
a lot of people have confirmed that if she were less intelligent, she would not have survived as long as she did in that world. I honestly think she knew how to play her part. How, uh, she was probably adept at manipulating people to her to her betterment, although she was, you know, owned in many ways. But but it's just such a sad, sad, sad reality. I mean, before I forget to tell you, when my grandparents died, one of my aunts handed me two grocery sacks full of stuff. And at first glance, I didn't pay it much attention. Letters, driver's license, tax returns, pictures, things like that. But years later, those two grocery sacks of information became the first the first level of research that I did on my mother. Invaluable handwritten letters that that really reveal what she was thinking, doing, feeling throughout all of her life. And and one of the last letters that she wrote her mother talked about her being married to a man named Eugene and that they had bought a mobile home in the Cape Canaveral area and uh, were just living the good life, receiving paychecks from the government for life. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting to me in that that's not the CIA's style. They, There are so many people who are doing things that aren't being done by people who don't exist right. because they're not on an official payroll. Right. They're paid de facto, maybe through the mob connections, for example, or others that we've seen who are <laughs> private people, but adamantly in line with the CIA's mentality. And they're recruited as private individuals and the money is siphoned to them off the books from government paychecks. So it's kind of interesting to me that, your mother was receiving government paychecks. You don't have any stubs or anything, do you? I, I do not. You yeah. know, uh, I I feel fortunate to have some of her tax returns. I, I think mother was pretty adept at destroying anything that, yeah, Garrett, my, my wife is just reminding me from the living room that Gary Shaw believes that this was a witness protection program, that, that, that she was being paid by, by the government through that. There's such innuendo. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, we yes. want to know the answers. Know yes, I know. Well, well listen, let me, let me give you a strange answer that I didn't discover a researcher in California, a very close friend of mine, a research librarian who spends all of his time researching. He discovered CIA manuals that delineated certain ways to dispose of people and make it look like something else. And the exact scene of my mother's death out in the middle of nowhere is depicted in one of the manuals. Unbe I mean, I just I just shake my head. I'm shaking mine too. What was the guy's name again who, who, who happened upon that scene? The, uh, pardon, pardon me? What was the guy's name who happened upon the scene? Um, Jerry Don Moore. Yeah, I mean, he didn't buy it, right? I mean, he 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 knew it was sketchy from the outset. I think. Oh, he had to have known that yeah. it was sketchy. I mean, the suitcases in the middle of the highway. I mean, it, it was. It's an it's an assassination scene. So, but you know, I'm I'm for my my family ruined Jerry Don Moore's life, and I'm sad about that. He was a truck driver. They saw that he didn't do that for quite a while. Honestly, I think my family should have been thanking him for stopping picking her up. You know, I, I'm not sure I would have done that. He had been drinking at the time, so he was afraid, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm sure he was terrified. Uh, you know, and at some point, I, it, there's so many uh, rabbits to chase about Mother's Life. Forgive me for hopping around. But at, at the time when Jerry Dunmore was... Uh, to get the uh, analogy you just made. What rabbits and hopping around? <laughs> that was either pretty, pretty clever or. I'm or sorry about that. Unintentional. <laughs> while while Jared Ann Moore was tr was dealing with mother, trying to see if she was alive and making a decision about what to do, a, a carload of African Americans drove up. He stopped them, tried to get them uh, to assist him, and they refused because that was a time in history when. It wasn't a good thing for black men to be touching white women. 
everything about that scene is just surreal. Anything else you you, you think that that uh, I think we're okay here, uh, Michael? Yeah. How about you? Are you satisfied? Or? Oh, I'm pleased. I, you know, I I haven't talked about Mother's Life on, on a podcast for a while. It's good for me. It's good for me to walk through it. And someday when I see her, hopefully when I see her in heaven, I'm going to have a lot of questions. And she'll have a lot of answers, I'm sure. I hope. I hope. Well, thank you. Know, you. But I, I've tried to honor her with my life, you know, by... You know, I, re I really didn't have a whole lot of family support doing this. Uh, I don't think a lot of my family has read the book. But I think my family was so exhausted from my mother's escapades that they literally, one, one of my family members actually, look, I'm closing the chapter in, in, on that life. But it wasn't so easy for me to do that. Well, Dr. Michael Marcades, that's a hard C. In there, yes, yeah. Dr. Michael, Mark, we can't thank you enough. Uh, we, I don't think enjoyed, although we have enjoyed you. But yes, well, I, I've enjoyed our conversation. Story, but thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, Bill. You. Thank you, Reggie. I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>